Hello, everybody, and welcome back to What the Flick. What the Flick is What the Fright this month as we look at some of the best horror movies of the 21st century so far. My name is William Bibiani, and with me is Joe Lynch, the director of Knights of Bad Astem, Everly, Mayhem, uh, his new film coming out on November 10th in theaters yes. and on VOD. Uh, we're going to take a quick look at that movie and then talk to this really cool director about his work. Let's take a look. Say hello to the ID7 virus. Stress hormone levels rise, causing inhibitions to drop and basic instincts to rise to the surface. All traces of the virus should be eliminated in approximately eight hours. What are we supposed to do for the next eight hours? Try to remain calm. Hey, extreme measures, right? This is our shot. I'm offering 150 grand for Cho's head. We're talking about murder here. You should be offering at least 450. Mayhem, uh, 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 it's our Stephen Yun. Yes. And Samara Weaving, mm -hmm. and they are trapped in an office where everyone has been infected with a virus that turns off all of their inhibitions mm -hmm. and makes them more likely to act on it. You could not have sold it better. Thank you. Uh, where did that? Where where did this stem from? Because there's actually another movie quite like it this year, The Belko Experiment. It's kind, of, it's kind of ironic. There's a lot of movies quite like it in a way. Funny enough, uh, this is a story that I have not told, and it kind of pertains to our choices of movies that we're going to talk about in a little bit. But the uh, when I got the script, it was actually called Rage. Hmm. Uh, same same setup, same same story, same characters, and. When I read this script, I was actually working in an office job. So, you know, the story is about you know uh, this this virus that gets let loose in an office space. Uh, I was like pretty much pent up with a lot of rage in an office space. So I'm like, I know this character, I know this world, and it gave me the opportunity to kind of poke fun at the world of like passive aggression in the workspace in mm -hmm. the corporate world that just was driving me nuts. Like every time that I would see the words let's discuss on an email, I would start to get hives. <laughs> or that it would take, like if I had one, like guys, I got this great idea. What if we had this shot where it was this and this? And then it would take about 20 emails to get an okay because it would be a lot of, it just, it was the kind of thing that was just stifling me and I felt like here's a character that I can totally relate to and I, I immediately was like, I gotta do this movie. Now, flash forward a little bit, we finally, we get the money for it. We get the, the kind of, we get the, the green light industry term. And I, for some reason, I was, it never dawned on me. I'm reading this, I'm reading the script. I've read it over and over again. I'm working with the writer, you know, Matthias, over and over again for about a year. We got into a really good place. And then about a month before we actually left to go shoot the film in lovely Belgrade, Serbia. Ah. Uh, yeah. Um, I went, guys, I, gonna sound weird but doesn't 28 days later have a virus called the rage virus and suddenly <laughs> emails a flying and we all went like how did we miss this holy shit let's discuss yeah no there was a lot of less discusses on that so so very quickly it, like within a day we fit like we were able to fix the script where it was just a name it was just it mm. was minor details there but like at the same time the title being rage and also a Nicolas Cage movie had just come out that was called Rage. And we were There's a like, Gary Daniels movie There's called a Rage. Lot. Rage. Rage is all the rage in terms of titles. <laughs> Zing, dad jokes abound. And uh, But I remember just having the word mayhem in my head, so I kind of tossed that out. And shockingly, you know, with the producers of, of the movie, it only took about three or four emails for everybody to go like, mayhem, great, good, go, done, sounds great. Hmm. And uh, so thankfully we thwarted, uh, or we kind of, uh, we were circumvented a 28 days later uh, roadblock in a way. But, yeah. but you know, the, the movie when I first read it and when we were first kind of talking about the movie was very much the comparison of, you know, office space meets 28 days later. Yeah. Because, you know, the thing about the, f the film when people read it on page was, is this a zombie movie? And it wasn't, to me it never, it never was. The, the virus was only temporary. It didn't make people, you know, spit blood out and their eyes turn red and everything. It just well, they turn red. Well, they one eye turns. They get red. they get red. Eye. They they get one red eye. Uh, but and I needed that. I needed something, some kind of like visual histronic to make make it seem like people were actually infected. Otherwise, it was just going to be a bunch of sweaty white dudes beating the shit out of each other. And or we you already could, hear about. Or that. you could raise the question: How do we know they're not faking it and just doing whatever they want? Exactly. And they're not just evil people. Very good point. No one's ever brought that up before. You know, it's like sequel. Uh, <laughs> but but 
I, when um, when we were setting out to make this movie, I wanted to very specifically make sure that we weren't making something that was like derivative of the zombie movie. It was more, I mean, you could say kind of like The Purge. I mean, there were so many movies. To me, the movies that I kept watching when I was making this film were more A Clockwork Orange and The Wolf of Wall Street. Mm. And with The Wolf of Wall Street, I could easily go in and paint people's eyes red and it could technically be Mayhem 2 or Mayhem the prequel because everyone's so coked out of their brains that like it kind of already makes sense in that world. But yeah, the, the movie is my kind of like comment on the corporate world. It's comment on passive aggression. It's a, it's a comment on just kind of being yourself and kind of following your dreams or yeah. following your passions. Albeit with a lot of blood and nail guns and and power saws and uh, and Steven and Samara weaving. Yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun. And one of the things I think it's interesting because you have basically an excuse for nonstop chaos. And in order to structure this, you have actually kind of gamified your screenplay. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of influence of video games in screenplay structure lately. Yeah. And you've set yourself up with Steven Yeun and Samara Weaving. They have to go to a series of boss fights mm -hmm. and go to different levels oh, as, they, as they said. How intentional is that and how do you think that is affecting storytelling nowadays? If you look very closely in the movie uh, out November 10th, uh, there is a very direct homage to Bruce Lee's Game of Death. There you go. Uh, the mug that Steven is uh, is holding mm -hmm. is Bruce Lee's outfit from Game of Death. The yellow with the uh, the yellow mug with the white uh, the black oh stripe. God, it's right that. there. Oh it's my right God. there. So, but that uh, was something. But I that, hadn't seen the movie yet, so I didn't know that that was. The well, that's okay, the thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm okay. throwing an Easter egg out there, there now. You go. But uh, we we knew from the get go that we wanted to have something that was structured very much like a video game, or if anything, this was like one long cutscene for you know for an 80 minute cutscene to something that would be more akin to like a video game but mm. the the uh, the whole idea of going from like point to point to point it's very much like the corporate ladder as well i mean mm. corporate life is almost like a video game itself because mm. you are starting at the bottom and you're working your way up sometimes you drop sometimes you you know you escalate you go up in the ranks shoots and ladders there's always exactly there's always a boss battle every usually every thursday <laughs> when you have a, a creative review there's always a boss battle there yeah. And a lot of times, and, and this was in a lot of uh, in a lot of cases when I was in, in that kind of workspace, a lot of the bosses were very much archetypes, not people. And that's not to say that I don't have I didn't have amazing supervisors and bosses, but mm. they all filled a role, and those yeah. roles were very much just caricatures in a way. So that you know, reading that in the way that Matthias' script felt very much like a, a pinpoint reaction off of the, the corporate space, but then I could have a lot of fun with it myself uh, and, and infuse a lot of myself in the movie as well. And, and then when you collaborate with people like Steven and Samara, who were the most amazing people to collaborate with, all this stuff kind of happened organically and we just kind of raced over to Serbia and shot this movie, but did it in a way where we kind of let chaos reign in a way. It, it was like the fox in, in, a, in a Lars von Trier movie just going, chaos reigns for 25 days because we were always inspired. We were always like, not, not that we were going off of script, but we let the environment and we let the people around us and we let the inspiration just kind of take over. How do, you, how do you, in a situation like that where every character is completely unhinged and that's by design, how do you know when too far is too far? Or is there such a thing? There is, and uh, luckily, uh, between Matthias and Sean Sorensen, one of the producers, and myself, we actually made a chart for for all the phases of the virus. Ah. So you know, because the virus, uh, it, it basically, when you get uh, the kind of antidote, you have about eight hours um, between, by the time of uh, you become infected to the time that it kind of goes away. So we thought, all right, in that eight hours. Kind of like in 21 Jump Street, you know, when they had like phase one, phase two, phase three, rage mode. You know, it's like they had all these different kind of like stages of the virus. And we thought it would be really good for both the actors, but also the extras. Because we had over 100, 150 extras throughout the whole shoot. And they were very much part of the, the kind of tapestry of the chaos that we were creating. And I watch it all the time and I could always see someone who was like, not quite there. But for the most part, we were really lucky where we just had all these great act, like local actors in Serbia where we would say like okay you are stage one you're like you're a little itchy you're a little irritated maybe you're feeling a little sweaty or whatever but then you go to stage two and it's like now you, you suddenly tell yourself you know like you find yourself kind of not realizing what's coming out of your mouth by stage three you are uh, you're, you're losing all of your inhibitions stage four is you've gone full rage mode and stage five is kind of like the come down and every day, Steven and Samara and I, because we shot it mostly out of order, 
we would have to kind of check ourselves every morning and say like, what, what stage are we at? What phase are we at? And we would also have to relay that also to the first ADs who would talk to the, uh, to the extras. One weird pro tip in, in the, the kind of production process is the director is not allowed to talk to, the, uh, to the, the extras. If you talk to the extras, you have to pay them as an actor. So I would have to relay this to my first AD, who would have to relay this to the Serbian second AD, who would now have to relate it to the actors or the extras on set. So and it became by that this time, weird kind of a, telephone. Yeah, by that time you're just saying purple monkey dishwasher at the end. By the the, yeah. the amazing game of telephone between me going like, okay, you're sweating, you're drinking, you know, like you're you're drinking, uh, whatever. Like you found alcohol in your your drawer and you're drinking it. Turned into you're now putting post its all over your face. <laughs> I don't know how that game well, of telephone too. changed, but it was great because yeah. the actors and the, all the extras really went for it, and they just went like. Screw it, let's, let's go crazy. We had some insane moments on set where we didn't really know what was gonna happen with some of these extras, and some of them got a little overzealous. Some of them got a little, uh, how should we say, uh, aroused, so to speak. Uh, th there, were, there were a lot of moments that if you look in the background, there's, a whole, there's all, all these other stories going on in the background while we have our, kind of, our heroes in the foreground trying to save the day. I'm not sure I approve. Okay, well, uh, let's <laughs> talk about uh, Stephen Yun and Samara Weaving, you've got uh, two really wonderful actors here. I think a lot yeah. of people know Stephen Yun from The Walking Dead, but we get to see a totally different Never heard of that him. show. Yeah, I know. I Origins. It's, That's where I saw him. There you go. No. Uh, but we've also we've also got Samara Weaving, who I think a lot of people just weren't super familiar with. Mm -hmm. And between this and The Babysitter, she is having such a breakout year. She's really incredible. This, The Babysitter, she's in Martin McDonough's new movie, Three uh, Three Billboards, blah, 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 blah. Uh. She's on that new show, Smilf. She's in, um, what is it, the reboot, the Amazon reboot of um, Picnic and Hanging Rock. I didn't she even is, know about that. Uh, yeah, and, and the stuff that I've seen on what? that. Yeah, Weird. and it looks amazing. Weird. She is going to blow up. Is Peter up. Weir involved in that? I don't know, but it, like it looks, it looks very Weir esque. They're they're going, right. they're doing it right. Oh, okay. Well, but great. I saw Samara. Funny enough, I when I was first exposed to her, it was from Ash vs Evil Dead. Mm. Um, she was in that like four episode arc at the end of the first season where it's like the four Australian backpackers who kind of happen upon the cabin and next thing you know she's being thrown around the room. She's getting cockroaches put in her her underwear. It's like all right, anybody who let. Sam Raimi put cockroaches in her crotch. I think I can work with that person, you know, because I'm going to be doing some crazy shit as well. And funny enough, uh, I was actually up for the babysitter at one point, and I remember reading that script going, who the hell are they going to get? Cut to a year later, and I'm on Skype with, with Samara, and I had no clue that she was the babysitter. So I'm like, oh, so what did you just do before this? Oh, I did this movie with the babysitter. Wait, you're the babysitter? Oh, yeah, mate. I'm like, you're in. Done. Because I know that part, <laughs> and that part is bug bug shit can I say shit yeah guys that part is bug shit crazy and if you can pull that off I that's the kind of person I need I needed someone who could kind of counterbalance Steven because Steven was taking it very seriously he was trying to make it as grounded as possible and the thing that was amazing about Steven and Samara in a way was they were two polar opposites both in terms of technique but also in character where Steven was trying to be as serious and grounded as and relatable as possible and be able to kind of see how this is a character that is stifled you know he's been he's had an emotional tourniquet on his on his life because he's just been thinking so he's been so career minded that he hasn't been able to be himself and in, and in thus making him less of who he is and Stephen every day would challenge me and this was great like I I, I wish that every director gets to work with someone like Steven or Steven himself, but I'm sure he's booked, uh, is he would, he would te technically check me every day on term, in terms of tone. Mm. And how far should I take something? How, like, how crazy can I get here? Should I go too crazy? What phase am I at? And we would have these long conversations, you know, whether it was the night before or like there's that time between when you block a scene out and when you st start the first shot in the morning. It's about 45 minutes or whatever that's the time that we would sit there and go, okay, how does this all work? Because tone with this movie was gonna be so integral to how we were gonna be able to kind of get the point across and have the sugar to make the medicine go down before it becomes too mean yeah. or too goofy and there's no stakes involved at all. So because of Steven and, and then Samara would kind of react off of that and say like, okay, Steven is going here, well then I get to go here because I knew that my character would be the one that, like, if Steven is feeling remorseful about someone actually dying, 
I can go, ha ha, this is great, I love this shit. So those two together were really like the anchors of the movie to where the tone needed to be every day. Yeah. I mean, they're the reason why the movie is what it is. I, I do, I think they're, they're, I agree. I think they work Cheers really to wonderfully that. together. And uh, I listen, I really like Mayhem. I saw it at South by Southwest. I'm so glad you're finally going to get the chance to see it. On November 10th, uh, we're going to start talking about some horror movies right now that he didn't direct. Yeah, I uh, wish that I wish I directed that. I What? I, well, come on. I mean, yeah. the ones we're talking about are two seminal classics. But really quick, so Mayhem's coming out November 10th. Uh, I recommend it highly. Obviously, I'm a little biased. See it in the theater. It's it's playing in select theaters around the the nation. We've been touring it with uh, in the festival circuit for the past like eight months, and it really is a crowd pleaser. So, on Friday night after work, when you're you know you've had a really crappy week, and all your buddies are like, let's go to Marie Callender's for a couple drinks. Stop. Go to the theater. Get those drinks and go to the theater. And I guarantee you, it will cure your case of the Mondays that next week. It's a it's a total crowd pleaser. It's one that you want to see with like a, a group of people. A completely objective opinion from Joe Lynch, everybody. Thank you so much. And you can hear him every week on the Movie Crypt podcast. Good plug. <laughs>